Welcome to this week in Health IT Solution Showcase, where we explore solutions to challenges we face in health IT. Today, we're going to take a look at responding quickly to endpoint threats. Uh, we're going to do that with CrowdStrike. We're also going to talk to a CISO for St. Luke's out of the Kansas City area. And we have a returning guest, a security expert and uh, director of healthcare for Sirius, Vic Naji. So we're looking forward to that conversation. My name is Bill Russell, former healthcare CIO for a 16 hospital system and creator of This Week in Health IT a channel dedicated to keeping health IT staff current and engaged. Uh, quick note, we launched a new podcast today in health IT where we look at one story every weekday morning. Uh, check it out. You can subscribe. It's a different channel altogether. You go to wherever you subscribe to podcasts and you can go ahead and subscribe. It's called Today in Health IT. Uh, we're going to be releasing uh, five episodes just this week, Monday through Friday, and we'll do it again next week. So uh, looking forward to that. We also have a new schedule for our podcast for 2021. Monday, we're going to do news. Wednesday, influence or solution showcase. And Friday, we're going to do our influence interviews. Uh, be sure to check back for more great content. Now on to today's show. Today, we get really pragmatic on how to address the uh, endpoint security threats, and we have three great guests with us. We have David Maddox, the Chief Information Security Officer with St. Luke's. Uh, that's St. Luke's out of the Midwest, out of the Kansas City uh, area. We have Tina Thor Thorstenson. Is that correct, Tina? You got it. That's it. Great. Cybersecurity strategist with CrowdStrike and Vic Naji, who is returning, who has been a guest on the show before, uh, director of healthcare with Sirius. Welcome to the show. I'm looking forward to this conversation. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. There's a lot going on in cybersecurity. I, it's, my daughter just came home from, from college and I, we were just talking about cybersecurity and, and I, I know, I know. This is kind of weird. My daughter is, you know, 20 years old and we're talking cybersecurity. That probably tells you more about me than it does about her. But, and, and she was saying, well, during the pandemic, cyber, cyber terrorism and cyber attacks really have gone down. But that really isn't the case, is it? Is it? I mean, we've, we've seen a significant amount of activity over the last six to nine months. We, we absolutely have. And at, at uh, CrowdStrike, we we keep track of the adversary activity. We track more than 140 uh, different actors, and we're, we've seen more activity in the first half of 2020 than all of 2019 alone, and it's just continued to go up. Yeah, and, and we just have uh, new information and new, uh, new threats. We Obviously, we just had the SolarWinds announcements this week and a lot of activity going on there. All right, so what we're, we're going to talk specifically about endpoint uh, security and endpoint threats. And David, I'm really glad you're on the show. We, we are going to talk about what St. Luke's has decided to do. But before we go there, give us a little background on your health system. How, how big is your health system and what's your, what's your area of coverage? Well, absolutely. And thanks for having me uh, participate in this discussion. St. Luke's is a health system that includes 18 hospitals and campuses across the Kansas City region. So we're in western Missouri and eastern Kansas, a 64-county area that encompasses our service area. We're particularly proud to say that we're one of the nation's top 25 cardiology and heart surgery programs. We're also the nation's leading stroke reversal program dedicated to preventing strokes and treating strokes. We're really proud of some of those accomplishments. We're the region's only treatment center for advanced breast cancer. And we also have a nationally recognized children's behavioral health center. So we're really busy, and needless to say, and we're very proud of what we do, the services we provide to the greater Kansas City area. And my team is particularly proud of the services we provide to the clinicians and the physicians to ensure that they're healthcare environment is, is safe and secure, and we provide the services that our, our, our neighbors within the community expect from us. So we're, we're, we're pretty big, not really big, but big enough to, to really be a, a major contributor to our community, and, and we're really proud of the services we provide. So David, give us a little, since we're going to talk about endpoint security, what, what number of endpoint devices, number of staff that you that you have total across the system and how big is the IT organization? 
So let's start with devices. We have about 15,000 devices that we're tracking and managing on a daily basis. Our staff is about 13,000 employees. The IT staff is about 400 and the security staff is about 20 individuals. So we compare to folks we benchmark ourselves against, we're probably a little bit smaller from a staffing perspective, but we, we leverage technology and services like CrowdStrike to help augment our, our service offerings and, and we're pretty good at what we do. Now that's fantastic. So here's, here's what I'd like to do for this. I'd like to start, start out pretty broadly and just talk about the cybersecurity space and then move in a little bit, talk about the industry, healthcare, and the industry itself and in, in, in the cybersecurity context. And then, David, I'm going to come back to you, and, and I'd really like to talk about how you've approached endpoint security. So before we get there, let, let's talk about the problem and the challenge. Tina, let's, what's the overall challenge that the industry is facing in terms of, not the industry, but just, just broadly, because you serve more than just healthcare, what are we seeing out there? What's the challenge of, of really securing those endpoint devices? So, Bill, that's a great question, and you're right. I serve not only healthcare, but the broader public sector community. And you know, CrowdStrike is a, is a global uh, organization with many, many customers across all industry verticals. So it's such a great question to, uh, to start with. As, as we kicked off, the the chat here the adversarial activity is is on the rise so there's no no question about that that there are so many different organizations trying to uh, disrupt the healthcare industry and the and the broader industry verticals and either just to disrupt or to steal right so as we've seen in the news even very recently lots of activity out there. So the, the challenge is that, and, and David, I, I spent many, many years running some variety of IT and security operations, so I certainly, certainly understand uh, your perspective on this. The complex IT infrastructure just continues to, to, to grow. So one of the big challenges is we're here to talk about endpoints today, laptops, desktops, servers. We call all of those endpoints, whether it's in the cloud or on, on premise. And uh, you know, each operational executive and practitioner has to manage this, this increasingly complex infrastructure, which I think is, is certainly a huge challenge for um, all organizations. And then the other challenge in the space is that this, until recently, the solutions, they weren't there. When uh, I spent time as a deputy CIO and CISO for Arizona State University, most recently before changing careers and joining CrowdStrike, and I got lots of battle scars from from solutions that didn't work out so great. But the the great thing is there are next gen solutions solutions here now, and so that that frames up a little bit of the problem, I think. Yeah, and we're we're going to talk about about the CrowdStrike solution here in a minute. The the thing I, re- I remember is just there was so such a proliferation of tools. We had like 35 different tools trying to uh, secure the endpoints. And it was, it was just kind of a nightmare to try to manage all those tools. And anytime you increase complexity, you open the door for uh, human error, error within the uh, code base, all sorts of other things. Um, Vic, you and I have talked uh, zero trust framework. We've talked a lot of security items on the show. Give us an idea of what the industry is is trying to do around security. What does this year look like specifically in terms of what healthcare is trying to do and, and what's working and what's what's maybe not working at this point? I, uh, I read somewhere the other day, you know, I used to say that we're in like the 376th day of March, but I read something even better that we're actually in the fifth year of 2020. So I don't know if this year is like, uh, Fairly upside down, things keep changing, but a few things I think remain pretty clear as to what healthcare organizations are trying to do just around security. I think there's been a big shift and it's happened over over a period of time, but this year I think it's really accelerated it where this notion around protecting the perimeter and focusing on the data center related technologies for security 
I think has changed, the mindset has changed, and David can correct me here as we go along, but I think that this focus around the, the new perimeter being identity, being the person, being the endpoints, really with, with the focus on those, those seem to be the easiest ways in. Like if you study any of these malware-related attacks or any of the attacks, sort of one, one aside, a lot of them are starting from straight phishing, right? So these are things that get impacted or come in from proliferation of or a compromise of individuals and these individuals are working on endpoints. So this whole notion around how do I actually protect the endpoints while I still keep everything inside safe and balanced, that's number one. And then operationally, and I think we just touched, both Tina and David touched on this, and you did too, Bill, operationally, given this sort of smorgasbord or hodgepodge or whatever you want to call it of all these tools and technologies and capabilities and applications that we have inside of healthcare that have to be very carefully orchestrated and balanced, you add something else on and it's just a little bit off kilter and it kind of like breaks the whole balance and now suddenly you have performance issues or your application doesn't run, so then what's the standard answer is my application should be exempt from AV. My application should be exempt from whatever because it's not going to work if you don't do that. Well, then what's the point, right? I mean, if you actually go and read some of the SolarWinds stuff, like part of the reason why it got as far as it did is because the specific instructions were that these binaries and these applications themselves were exempt from any of the other tools that may or may not have caught issues that were going on with this particular tool simply because it it's like, it just won't work if you scan this, right? So long story short, I think in healthcare, what's happening is people are starting to get to the point of saying, okay, this whole malware thing is really getting us to start to think about like endpoint protection. We have to do that, but we have to do it in a way that doesn't break everything else. And we have to be able to operationally manage it. And we really need something that's not going to completely crush the environment. So that's kind of how I see it. Yep. So, so David, let's come back to you. I assume some of this stuff resonates with you in terms of the challenge. What, what was the specific challenge that, that you were trying to address at St. Luke's and how did you go about addressing it? Well, first, I, I feel like after listening to Vic, I, I need to put a little bit of money in the offering plate because what he's saying rings so true to the, the challenges that, that we, we face every day. From an endpoint perspective, the, the, the device you provide an employee is, is just as personal as their cell phone or their tablet or something else. So what we're seeing in, in the challenge we were trying to solve with, with this particular solution was we needed something that, that really went across a, a wide variety of platforms and operating systems. And to Vic's point, we needed something that was fairly seamless and, and that it had a, a really small footprint. So we, we have and, and we continue to have and we will always, in my belief, have some kind of malware threat at the endpoint. And, and you need a solution that you feel confident in that can not only detect but provide you the capabilities to quickly remediate and, and that was our number one objective. But at the same time, to, to Vic's point, it, it cannot interrupt the objective. So it, it cannot stop patient care. It cannot prevent a person from sending an email. It cannot get in the way because at, at, some, at a certain point in time, the, the end user or even your peers on the technology side lose confidence in that system. And then it becomes the, the default when we, we troubleshoot is we remove AV or we turn this off. It, and that's not what, what, what we want. So I'll just share with you, we had some very core principles when we were selecting a solution and, and they were really around broad coverage, as I've mentioned, uh, a small footprint. We, we wanted a very effective and intuitive management console because you've got a lot of people with different skill sets who may be at some point in time required to, to help us determine a problem. We want a clearly defined remediation playbook. So if you see something based on the asset class, here's what you do. And then we wanted a, a capability to collaboratively threat hunt. So once again, we have a certain set of skills within our environment that allows us to identify things based on certain behaviors. 
but by incorporating an intelligent set of tools, we're also able to lean on some very smart, intelligent experts that say, based on what we're seeing in your environment and the, the past behaviors, here's things we recommend you either address or how you tune our system to be more effective, et cetera. But we wanted that extra expertise to help us stay sharpened in our efforts to protect the system. And then the last thing, which is most important, is we have to justify the investment. So we want an SLA or something that helps us verify that the money we're spending is effective and we want metrics to show that the controls we say are in place are actually in place and, and they're effective. So interesting. So you ended up going in the CrowdStrike direction, as you mentioned earlier. And so here's what I've heard so far from you. I heard lightweight, so that a lightweight agent, so that it wasn't intruding with the, the, just the, the 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 normal care that is going on. It wasn't impacting clinicians. It wasn't impacting their workflow. That was that was number one. And number two, broad set, right? So we're not only putting it on on uh, Windows 7, we might be putting it on Windows 10, we might be putting it on uh, just a, a ton, ton of different devices. So you needed a, a broad set there. You wanted to elevate your team to really be able to identify those key events that you needed to uh, look into and do threat hunting. Am, am, I, am I on track so far? You're absolutely right. So to your third point, those indicators are compromised. Most AV systems out there will say, hey, there's something on your system that's been identified by a signature of some sort. The, the difference between a traditional solution and CrowdStrike is CrowdStrike is looking at the behaviors um, that are displayed with on, or within that device. So it may say, hey, we, we've seen an executable fire. It's running a, a script. It's going out or it's trying to make a call to an IP address or it's trying to do a set of things that are either abnormal or that have been verified to be malicious in nature. Those are the things that you don't necessarily get with a traditional solution. And, and that's why we felt it was very important for us to get to really the next level of endpoint protection that allows us to not only say, yeah, we, these are known indicators, known hashes, known bad things. We, we, we know those. The community uh, shares that information. We push that out as quickly as possible. But there may be tactics that are new that we also need to be aware of. And CrowdStrike is smart enough to say these tactics have not occurred in your environment before. Either we're confident that it is something that we need to get off of the machine or let's collectively work together to determine if it's uh, legitimate or not. And if it's not, then we will add that those indicators to our set of services and going forward when they see it, we will know what to do about it. So, so Tina, that's the difference between signature-based and behavioral, sort of behavioral analysis of, you know, what's actually going on on the device. I remember those signatures. We used to have, always update them and, you know, then something new would come out and it wasn't really looking for it yet. So it was sort of, it, we sort of had to know what we were looking for before we could find it. But now this sort of changes the game a little bit. Talk, talk, about, talk about that solution a little bit. Absolutely. So, so David's absolutely right. I mean, we, we were on a mission and, and at CrowdStrike, we say we are on a mission to stop breaches, right? We, we are not leveraging signature-based technology at all. We do have what you might consider traditional AV leveraging machine learning to proactively stop attacks that have malware incorporated in them. But what we've seen, and it continues to, to be on the rise, is that the number of attacks that have malware included in them is uh, diminishing. It's now less than half of the attacks we see. Right. So, so solutions that are only going after the malware-based attacks are, are missing a lot of the problem. So the, the solution that, that we have, we call it a next-gen solution, born in the cloud, designed for the cloud, we collect the telemetry off the sensors that are deployed across millions of devices uh, around the globe. And, and we leverage that data to protect organizations. So where we can see indicators of attack, interestingly, as we track these adversaries, 
they, they follow similar patterns each time, right? So, so our thinking is that if we can help organizations respond in what we call a 11060, um, a minute to detect an issue, 10 minutes to triage it, and 60 minutes to remediate it, to resolve the issue completely, organizations can get out in front of the vast majority of attacks on their system before they get to the point of having, say, PHI be exfiltrated or any other sensitive data that they wouldn't wish to have out. Or maybe the adversary is just after disrupting organizations. Certainly, we wouldn't want that to happen in the healthcare um, environment. We've seen some recent news that way as well. So, so we created a next-gen uh, solution, single lightweight agent, as David has alluded to, that doesn't require a reboot. The, uh, the doctors and the nurses and the staff, they don't have to do anything to, to activate this, uh, this solution. And you know, then David's team, especially the security team, can focus on those behavioral activities that, that, that come in from the CrowdStrike solution and, and resolve things without the uh, the hospital really even understanding that uh, that these things are going on behind the scenes because we do it in such a non-disruptive way. Yeah, Vic, Vic I want to come back to you. And, and David, I'm, I want to come back to you. But Vic, talk to me about, talk to me about architecture and, and overload, right? So we, we, we sort of alluded to this earlier. When you, when you reduce the number of solutions, it, it sort of makes you feel like you're not covering everything. But in reality, when we simplify the solutions, it, it, it appears more and more like we're looking at the right things instead of having point solutions for 20 things. We're now looking at the behaviors of what's going on in the cloud and on our network. So we're, we're able to do things. Talk about the architecture moving forward. Why? Why is a cloud solution? Why is the lightweight agent? Why, why does all this stuff work for healthcare? Yeah, good question. I think that there's a couple of different things. So there's the technology aspects of it that we talked about, but then there's also a couple of things that Tina mentioned and David also alluded to, which is around the people process aspects. So I want to touch on all three of those to say, how does this, how does this sort of a, a partnership, if you will, between a health organization and a CrowdStrike how does it actually become a one plus one equal to six sort of thing, right? So technology, you simplify it, you have a, a fewer panes of glass, it's the unicorn of the single pane of glass, right? We'll, we'll leave that aside, but fewer panes of glass makes it a lot easier for you to be able to know what's going on in your environment. And assuming you've picked, you know, a solution that is has high fidelity and can 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 detect anomalies that are not just coming off of a dictionary that you fed into the system, which is very old school, right? It's more around behavior and uh, anomaly detection and so on, like we just discussed. Then you can have a high level of fidelity and, and confidence in the fact that this platform will find things that are not seeming to be normal and you can do something with it, like the 11060. That coupled with the lightweight aspect of it, the thing that you can actually go in and convince people to say, you're not going to need a reboot. We're going to put it out there. We're going to monitor performance. We're going to make sure that the telemetry performance is good. People aren't going to complain. And if they do, then we'll work through it and resolve it and build confidence that the cybersecurity function builds confidence across the rest of the organization. That's the one technology piece I think that the healthcare organizations can really benefit from by simplifying the rest of the stuff that they have deployed for the various agents. The second piece, and I think this goes in tandem, is the combination of how CrowdStrike has built this entire thing in a, in a, in a cloud-first environment, which allows them to use their every single one of their global customers and every single thing that they see across these global customers as the base for your environment. So you might be St. Luke's that's running in, in, in the Midwest in the U.S., but you're benefiting from all of the anomalies that CrowdStrike is seeing across the globe in near real time. So this is not like an ETL process where they're like, oh, I'm going to batch out stuff that I've seen over the last six months and then feed a repository to say, oh, if you see something like this, then you should do something about it. That's so, we, so, we, right? so we don't have to rely on David and his staff to do something. It's Exactly. 
Exactly right. right. But but it's a combination and a partnership. That's why it's so important because David and his staff know the health system better than anybody else ever could, right? So bringing those things together to say, okay, we're seeing something go on. It seems like one of those things that we've seen go on in wherever, which country, pick, pick some country, seems to be something similar going on here. Now let's work with the staff locally to say, hey, let's go look at this thing, say, is this really that or is it something different that looks kind of like that? And then if it's a false positive, that's fine because there's a few of those, but better to err on the side of caution than to just shut the system off and then impact care. So I think that's the, that's the people process side. And when you put all those things together and you add the simplicity of the solution, the way it's deployed, the less, the, you don't have a big burden in terms of deploying and monitoring, et cetera. I think that the, and then that's when you bring the IT group in as well, right? Because they are responsible for a lot of the, the deployment and management and networking and so on. I think a combination of those really is what helps the healthcare organization move forward. Yeah. And David, I, I want to talk to you about the, the people side of it, which, which Vic just brought up. I want to talk about the experience of your team because you are the quintessential case of you did outsource a portion of this to CrowdStrike and then elevated what your team's doing, which is the promise. We always say that about outsourcing. We're going to, we're going to elevate the team. Uh, and, and you've been able to do that. Talk about that a little bit. Well, it's, it's, it's a learning process. I, I, I will have to admit that when we first uh, started to consider the complete Falcon solution, my team was a little apprehensive because the first question is, is Dave, can they respond fast enough? But as part of the partnership, you understand that an organization like CrowdStrike brings a very um, high level of expertise to the table. And what we're looking for is really trying to address the problem, which is how do we quickly resolve endpoint issues? What I will share with you is when we first entered into the agreement and we started to uh, configure the solution, we would see alerts pop up on the console just like the Falcon team would see them. And the, the tendency was for us to just jump in and try and resolve them. But what we found out is we may be in the midst of trying to figure out what was going on and CrowdStrike would send us a alert and say, oh, by the way, we have remediated this system. And so, what I would share with you is you're exactly right. We, we decided that we were going to let the experts do what we engaged them to do and leverage that relationship to learn how to get better at the areas that we needed to get better in. And that's actually threat hunting. And what's really interesting about how the dynamic evolved is we can pick up the phone and there are times when we're on the, the phone with CrowdStrike three or four times a week not necessarily about a specific endpoint issue, but hey, something has come out. How do we use the tool to understand what the indicators of compromise are? And then how do we make sure that our system and our protections are protected? And that's the value that a service like CrowdStrike brings because we have an exercise we call LOE. Every time an alert comes out, we want to understand as quickly as possible what our level of exposure is. And so from a desktop perspective, we can quickly go to the console. CrowdStrike has a community of, of threats that are out there. So I can go read about any of the threat gangs or anything that's going on along with the indicators of compromise. And I can search my system to see if that's even shown up in my environment. Those are the value adds that we didn't do before. So not only do they provide a service that remediates at the desktop, they also provide information on the back end where we can actually learn this particular variant of ransomware may not specifically be applicable to your environment. We haven't seen it in the healthcare environment. So your, your threat hunters are actually being proactive looking Absolutely. at you. Absolutely. Yeah. They're yeah, being that's... proactive, but they, they have expertise behind them that can also help them look in the right place. So it's kind of cheating on Easter egg. If, if you have somebody kind of tell you where to look, you'll probably find the eggs. And, and that's what CrowdStrike is, CrowdStrike is helping us do is, is we're not just hunting, we're hunting intelligently. Yeah. So Tina, talk, talk a little bit about, I, I, I think the solution is called the Falcon solution. Is that correct? Right. Mm -hmm. that, that, would, that would make sense. So talk a little bit about that. I mean, one of the things that, that we heard was after hour support. And 
the first thing that comes to my head is how many of the attacks actually happen after hours? Probably a majority, I would imagine. Uh, talk about that service and how, how it helps an organization that maybe only has 20 people trying to cover 13,000 devices across 60 counties. Absolutely, Bill. So essentially what we've done at CrowdStrike is we've, we've flipped the model. The old model was that security companies would come in and, and maybe even in 24 uh, by seven service, just fire off alerts. And, and that generated a lot of alert fatigue. When you, if you can imagine the, uh, the user experience for the analysts at the, at the customer and not even knowing where to start because the alerts are coming in so fast, they don't know which ones are false positives, which ones are high fidelity alerts. So, so we completely changed that model. We only send high fidelity alerts and we only send those that we haven't already resolved. You can get to those, to David's point. You, you can see where the, uh, the tax services has been. But what we offer, in addition to a, a suite of products that uh, an organization can deploy through, through the help of alliance partners like uh, Sirius, with uh, Vic here on the call with us today. Beyond that, this Falcon Complete option is basically designed to be an extension of the security team to allow the internal teams to do more high value things that are very specific to their healthcare organization and allow CrowdStrike to do what CrowdStrike does best, uh, which is basically minimize the attack service that you see coming in that people have to pay attention to anyway. Let technology do what technology does best. Immediately protect where, wherever we can detect and respond quickly again within that hour time frame and uh, david and each one of our customers can see exactly how quickly we're responding on on each one of those and, uh, and we work hard to uh, to respond well within that that threshold and then mitigate things before they turn into a breach because you know as, as david was talking about when you see when we see an executable fire up that uh, just doesn't look quite right if we can stop it there before the reconnaissance happens, because once an adversary gains a foothold, they look around to see what they can do. What, what can they monetize? What can they disrupt? And then they'll just deploy additional uh, technology. And if we can stop them at that front gate, that's huge. And that's what the complete team does. And much like we're seeing play out right now this week with some of the recent announcements, we follow the same methodology. We, we put a a uh, blog up recently this week, straight off the CrowdStrike page, talking about how the adversary is taking this identity-centric approach. You know, I think it was Vicky mentioned it early on. I, I call it, if you can just ask somebody for their uh, you know, car keys and walk away with it, why, why not? I mean, it's, it's the simplest solution for an adversary to, to walk in and look like, look like a legit user. And uh, what what uh, CrowdStrike is about is pairing what we're seeing, the activity we're actually seeing go on on the device uh, with the identities um, of, of who is logging in and what they typically do, that behavioral piece, to see if, it's, if it looks legitimate or not. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things I want to uh, close with, I've been asking guests of the show uh, a variation of this question over the last a couple of months, and, and that is, what do you think the lasting impact on healthcare IT is going to be as a result of what we've experienced over the last 12 months? As a result of the pandemic, what's going to be the lasting impact, do you think, on health IT? I guess, Vic, I'll start with you. David, I'll end with you. Vic, what, what's, what's the lasting impact of the pandemic on health IT? And things are things are going to move a lot quicker, just because we've demonstrated that that we can do things quicker and and better. To tell how any of those pick any of those examples sort of showed us that we could do that. The things that would take a couple three years to do, we've been able to do in months. 
Second is, I think the whole notion of the cloud and cloud scale, even if you don't pick your stuff up and move it out to the cloud, but just learning from cloud scale type things like CrowdStrike, I think has become very, very important because the landscape that you had to focus on previously used to be fairly local, but now it's like a global landscape, especially when you think about security, right? Security related things. So I think, and then there's a whole bunch of variations amongst those, you know, remote work, et cetera, et cetera. But I think this whole notion around identity being the new perimeter and how does security tie in, I think those are things that are going to change, that have changed and that will continue to sort of evolve as we go forward. That's, that's just how I see it. Yep. Tina, lasting impact on health IT as a result of the pandemic or, or health IT security as a result of the pandemic? Yeah, la lasting impact. Innovation opportunities are being fast-tracked. We're seeing that are already pick up, much like Vic was uh, mentioning, these digital transformation efforts underway to simplify the technology infrastructure, kind of where we started, and also leverage the new tools and solutions that are, that are there today that weren't there you know, just a short time ago. And the second thing in terms of lasting impact, and I think it's representative of the group you brought onto this call today, is this community aspect where we're all working together to bring solutions to defend against the adversary since we're having a security conversation or help solve, you know, IT health hygiene issues and it takes a village. And David, we're going to give you the last word, lasting impact on health IT or health IT security as a result of the pandemic. Well, I'd say there's a couple of things. One in particular that, that we've seen within our health system is that the patient is now comfortable with virtual visits. And so the, the old paradigm of I've got to get to a hospital or I've got to get to a doctor's office to see my physician has changed and has changed significantly. We've seen the number of telehealth visits skyrocket as a result of the pandemic because you still have to see your caregiver. And we're building models now that are fast tracking, providing care in non-traditional, which will soon be traditional models, whether it be at home or in other places outside of the traditional locations. So that kind of dovetails into what Vic is saying. The, the, the locations where we provide service, deliver service, access service are no longer in those traditional places. So identity is crucial. The other piece that I would say to that is the patient identity is just as much a part of our ecosystem going forward as uh, a clinician or an administrative assistant or someone else. They're all within that one ecosystem now. So we have an even greater responsibility to protect the identities that are assigned to us or that are within our realm of care. So the challenges are growing exponentially. People are moving quickly. They're dispersed. The devices they use are, are just as diverse as the people we treat. But the expectations are still the same. No matter who it is, whether it's a patient or an uh, administrative person or whatever, the expectation is that their data is secure which means that we've got to have some pretty sophisticated tools that are portable and that don't interrupt patient care. So things are dynamic and they're changing fast and I don't see them going back to the, to the old ways. Fantastic. I, I want to thank the three of you for, for sharing your experience and wisdom with the community. Uh, great solution. Really appreciate uh, what you're doing at St. Luke's, what you're doing at CrowdStrike. And, and Vic, always love having you on the show. And uh, just just knocking it back and forth and, and hearing what's going on. You, you look a little tired, Vic. Is, it, <laughs> is there a lot going on right now? Yeah, I am a little tired. But that's for another day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the it's it's interesting because we had sort of a break when when we surged early on. Like people didn't know what to do. People were going home, and there was this sort of a lull and then it is really picked up towards the end of this year. So hopefully the health IT staff have gotten a chance to get a, a break or will get a chance to get a break. We're actually recording this before the holidays. It'll air after the holidays, but hopefully people got a break over the holidays. Hey, thanks again for your time. Really appreciate it. All right. Thanks for the opportunity.
What a great conversation. I hope you enjoyed it and got as much out of it as I did. Uh, if you know someone that might benefit from our channel, please forward them a note. They can subscribe on our website, thisweekhealth.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple, Google, Overcast, Spotify, Stitcher, you get the picture. We want to thank our channel sponsors who are investing in our vision and mission to develop the next generation of health IT leaders, VMware, Hillrom, and Starbridge Advisors. Thanks for listening. That's all for now.